We're at the Louis Miller Museum interviewing veterans. Uh, would you please state your name? Gordon McNeely. And Gordon, uh, could you tell me a little about, you know, before the service, what did you do? Okay, well, uh, I've lived in Hoosick since 1927. We came here from Bennington then. And uh, I graduated from school in the old Walter A. Wood High School. Uh, when I graduated, I was only 17, so you couldn't get much work back then. So I did various odd jobs between then and the time uh, that I was drafted. Uh, nothing spectacular happened, I guess. Uh, took me five years to get through high school because I, I uh, broke a leg when I went in and I had scarlet fever before I got out, so the first year was kind of a loss. But uh, I graduated in 1940 on my birthday, 17th birthday. And that about takes care of me before. Uh, All right, and what happened? How did you get to the service? What happened? Well. Uh, I had been working on the railroad about six months before I was drafted in January of 1943. What were you doing on the railroad? Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the fact that they have oilers on, on, the, on the sharp curves. Well, my, my boss and myself uh, took care of those oilers from Greenfield, Mass. to Mechanicsville, New York. Nice. We had, had the old motor car that you don't see much anymore. Yeah. And that was uh, different for me. Well, that's interesting. Yeah, it, it was a job that I knew nothing about until I got there. I see. All right, so here it is, 1943, and what happened? Well, it was drafted in January. Of course, we all went by train then. Don Frank of, of Hoosick Falls was our group leader when we left here. We Do you remember to, anybody else that went with you? Yeah, the, the mo two more boys from North Hoosick uh, went with me. There was a Maxon from uh, Berlin that went with me. And, of course, Don Frank. And I don't know that I Well, remember. that's good. We got some new names yeah, anyway. Everybody knows Don, that's yeah. for sure. All right, so then you, where did they, where'd you go on we by went train? We Upton. Uh, it was inducted up the end, you know that, up the end of Long Island. Yeah. And uh, got all the usual good shots here and there and, and uh, headed uh, out for Texas. And we, we uh, the railroad cars that we had had those old garden, wooden garden benches back then. We got stuck in a snowstorm, so we sat on those wooden benches all night the first night. Once we got through New York, we uh, it took us about, oh, I guess eight days to get to Texas. They didn't hurry. And I went to Camp Bowie, which is about 100 miles south of the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Got my basic training there. Uh, all I did in the service, I was a, a Morse code radio operator all through. My, my service years. Uh, uh, you took basic training in uh, Bowie. Bowie, Texas. Yeah. And then they sent you to Morse uh, well, School? No, we learned that there as, as part of our specialty. We, they had a radio school there. Oh, I see. And uh, I only learned the operation. I didn't learn the, uh, the repair. Uh, another, other people did that. All I did was, was operate high-speed Morse code. And I was attached to an artillery. I was in the artillery all of my uh, and I was in the headquarters battery, so we had fire control and, and uh, uh, logistics and that type of thing to communicate over the radio. And, and uh, what? Well, how long were you in the service? I was in three years. All right. So what? Did, where did you go from Bowie? Well, we uh, left Shanks in February of '44 to uh, landed in England, Liverpool, in the middle of the night. Got on those little shaky high-speed rail car and took us into the mountains of Wales, in a little town called Abergavenny. Spent some time there. And they moved us there to, from there to Ludlow, England. And uh, we went uh, from there down to Falmouth, the southern part of England. We waited there for about 10 days, uh, getting ready to hit Omaha Beachhead. Now, I didn't go in on the beachhead until three weeks after the, the D-Day. Uh, we had anticipated going in quite a bit earlier, but uh, if you probably remember, they struck a lot of resistance at Omaha, and our artillery was very long range. We had one of three outfits of 155 guns made in Waterville that were mounted on Sherman tanks. So our, our uh, 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 minimum range was a thousand yards. Well, the boys didn't get in a thousand yards for quite a while, as you 
remember your World War yeah. II history. Then they hit that hedge road they didn't yeah, know about. Yeah, yeah. They stopped. So we went in, went in uh, on the 28th of June. We went in, uh, lost the, lost one of the guns there in the water at that time. It was recovered, and uh, we commenced firing the first night we were there. And uh, we, uh, we all marveled at, at the push that came on on July 6th when there was hundreds of planes went over uh, in preparation for breaking out of the beach and going on towards Paris. And that did happen. Uh, we were then attached to the Third Army and I went with good old George Patton across, the, uh, across all of France and, and uh, that took uh, well, we had one rest break along about September in Rennes, France. And then we moved around through there, finally got uh, into Luxembourg where I was uh, uh, Thanksgiving of 44. We had our Thanksgiving dinner there. And uh, one of the things that I remember very well in, at that time, uh, we were on the southernmost tip of the Battle of the Bulge in December. And uh, uh, my friend Paul Herman and I were on perimeter guard in this little town, about like Hoosick, settled in a valley there, small. And the first shell that came in knocked us both down, but we didn't get any wounds. It, it, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with your, the, all kinds of stone walls and hedgerows over there, but it landed just the other side of the hedgerow from where we were standing, and the concussion knocked us down, but neither one of us got hurt except we were pinned down there from, from about 5.30 in the morning to 10 o'clock before we could get back to our, our uh, living quarters. We lost, uh, I think, eight, eight men in headquarters battery in that artillery shelling. Uh, I think about three that got killed and five or six that were wounded. And uh, being knocked down was one of the things I remember very well. Yeah, I'm sure you can't and, forget uh, that. We. Uh, one of the other things that I remember... Well, in that Battle of the Bulge, uh, what was, you were on the southern tip of it. We were in Luxembourg. I see. And we, uh, once they uh, got squared away, they called us up to Bastogne, Belgium, one of the uh, outfits to relieve the 101st Airborne that were stuck there. And we had, we had very mobile artillery, as I mentioned, so we could get up there probably quicker than, uh, than a lot of the others. So we went uh, up to Bastogne and... and uh, help relieve the 101st and do whatever was necessary. That, uh, There's a lot of battle at that time. We, up we in were the very storm. fortunate to be in, uh, in uh, the artillery, the infantry, and the armored infantry really took a, a licking in that. Uh, uh, I remember the 10th Armored Division, they, they cut almost fresh off the boat, and they sent them in there to Bastogne. And I, I don't know the number of casualties, but as we were approaching, the, the roads were just lined with American vehicles that were burned out, bombed out, and, and, and strafed out. Uh, and at that time, I figured I was lucky because just prior to going overseas, they, uh, they were going to send me to college to study electrical engineering. And I went to uh, Jonesboro, Arkansas, uh, the University of Arkansas, for about a week to take the preliminary test which I, I barely passed. And so I was called in before the Board of Review there, and they said, now, son, uh, you did pass your test, but we look at your uh, academic record and find that you really aren't prepared, which I wasn't. I hadn't studied a lot of math and science in high school. So he said, if you really want to go in this program, we'll pass you. But he said, it's going to be really tough because you don't have the background. So I opted not to. and. Uh, I later learned that quite a few boys that were in the 10th Armored had been yanked right out of that uh, program that I they see. gave it up and they shoved them over there with, with very little experience and boy, I mean, it showed they took a terrible yeah. look in there. That was the problem with the Battle of the Bulge. They oh, had so many replacements there, oh, they thought they had it made, so they oh, put in a lot of replacements. Didn't it, know what they were tough. doing. Yeah. It was tough. They got in there with no experience and casualties were terrific. And, and right in the middle of winter, you know, got, we were bad enough. We were sleeping outside in the snowbank, but they, they were really tough. We could get in a truck once in a while or in a building once in a while, but those guys in the infantry, 
kind of rough business, you know. Uh, All right, so you're up by Stone, and right after uh, the, bat the, the, batting, the Battle of the Bulge ended, what yeah, happened then? One of the other things that I remember about that time, we, uh, it was hard put to find a warm place to sleep, so we, uh, we burrowed into haystacks in the middle of the field to sleep, and as, as you know, some idiot lit a cigarette and was going to smoke in there, and uh, the haystack went up in flame. Nobody was hurt, and, and fortunately we didn't get uh, bombed or strafed or anything because uh, it certainly lit up the sky for a mile around. So we kind of laughed about it, even though it wasn't very funny, I guess, at the time. Yeah, that's an interesting story. Is there any other little tidbits that you had like uh, that that you remember? Well, on a more somber note, we were one of the first uh, people in the Buchenwald concentration camp, and that was uh, an experience which I guess nobody wants to remember very much about. The, uh, the furnaces were, of course, cold, and they, were, they weren't running, and the place had been cleaned up a little bit, but there was uh, all kinds of bodies stacked around, and, and, and uh, there were men and women all crowded into the barracks, and, and in uh, various uh, ways, uh, various parts of starvation, some of them, uh, even some of those that they had piled out on the outside, you could see a leg moving every once in a while. You know, it, it was really, I had never, I would never have believed it if I hadn't seen it, I guess. And I took pictures, so anybody that tells you that it didn't happen, well, uh, send them over. So that was one of the things that I remember, which was not a nice thing, but no. it, it, certainly, it certainly stuck in my memory. And I don't know, is anything else very, uh, very exciting? When the war ended, we were in the German castle, uh, which Hitler had taken over to, uh, to guard the, uh, the naval records. And we were on guard there. We had relieved a, a British unit, which had, had been guarding it prior to that. <coughs> That, of course, was in May, and uh, the castle had a swimming pool, and we hustled around. Nobody had any hose, and the nearest faucet was, seemed like a half a mile away, so we, uh, we scrounged the whole county and, and finally got hose enough to start water going in the pool. We got it up about three feet, and they moved us out, so we never did get swimming in the <laughs> pool. <laughs> we complained about that, and at that time we were... Uh, we had what we call an egg run in the morning. We would we would take sugar and coffee from the kitchen, and uh, go around to all the farmers and anybody that wanted to trade sugar and coffee for fresh eggs. We did, and uh, surprisingly enough, those people out in the country knew how to hide their chickens and their stuff from the army because they all had uh, something to barter for coffee and 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 sugar. Of course, they hadn't seen anything, any coffee and sugar in God knows how long. I see. And then at another time, we were, we were guarding a medical uh, unit, and we got oranges in our rations after the war. <clears throat> and we used to put the oranges out on the windowsill. And a couple of days uh, after being out there, the kids came and stole the oranges, of course. So we, well, we raised heck with them and followed them home and put a scare into them. And those kids, five and six years old, had never seen an orange. And so after that, when we got oranges, we, we called the kids and we gave them the oranges because we, we had plenty. That's one thing the GIs had with plenty of everything. And uh, it was amazing to know that a kid five years old had never seen an orange. Yeah, well, those were tough times. Of course, it was amazing to come back here and, and find out that you couldn't get everything you could get when you left. There wasn't any shortages when I, much when I left in 43, right. a little bit of gas rationing. But when you come back, you couldn't buy a lot of things. Which was a surprise. All right, so let's get with your army. You're in Bastogne, it's May. Yep. Or you're in that castle yep. in May. And then mm -hmm. what you, then there was only another month left. The war so. ended there when we were in when we were guarding the uh, the medical unit. And I remember that was in August. I remember that very well because we had just gotten orders to start waterproofing our vehicles uh, because we were heading for the Pacific. And uh, we hadn't. Uh, about two days after the war, after the bomb, they come around and said, hey, you guys can forget that. We're not going to, we're not going to go to the Pacific. We're going to go home instead. Yeah, that was a happy day. That was a happy day, one of the best days. But before we went home, they sent us to Austria, in a little town called Linz. Well, not too little. And we were in charge of uh, 
Oh, helping displaced persons uh, find a route to uh, uh, their respective home, Poland, Russia, Lithuania, wherever they might have come. And that's, we did that until uh, October. And then we, uh, I was tr transferred to another outfit to, uh, to go home. We, uh, we rode uh, in boxcars from Austria to La Haire, France. And that also was an experience. And, uh, they also didn't hurry us on that. We were all pretty anxious, but uh, that uh, we got there and we waited until uh, from, from the middle of October until just before, just after Thanksgiving, to, before we got the boat home. Uh, we came home on a victory ship and we were locked in the second hole down for about three days in a storm and we all we all figured hey we got shot at and everything else over there and, and now we're going to get killed <laughs> trying to get out of this dark place yeah. but we didn't obviously and uh, but I, I can tell you that I was a pretty scared kid that boat was going <laughs> like this <laughs> I had never been out in the ocean only uh, going over there yeah. in fact until I went in the service the farthest I guess I'd been away from home was either Hampton Beach or New York City. So I it see. was a pretty good experience. And where'd you land? Uh... Got home in New York, uh, went to uh, Fort Dix, was discharged on December 5th, came home. That's December 5th, 1945. Uh, just under uh, 33 months. 30... You were overseas 33, or in the service. How long were you overseas? Uh, from February 1944 till December 1945. I see. And one of the things that, that helped me get home quicker than some, because of our mobility, we were in five major battles in Europe, the European theater. And for each battle, you got five points towards your discharge. Yeah. So I got uh, a lot of guys only had one or two. And, yeah. Uh, so, so that helps you have enough points oh, we to were, rotate. I, I was very lucky in that respect. We got home quicker than some of the guys that had been in long time before me. I see. So that, All right, so you came back to uh, civilian life. You're out of the service now. Yes. Uh, what happened then? Well, I tried various jobs for two or three years. I was uh, tried carpentering, which didn't care much for. I was going to be a machinist. Didn't care much for that. And uh, was a uh, caretaker at, at the Colgate Estate for two or three years. And uh, they tore that building down, the, the mansion, they tore that down while I was there, so I had to get out of there. That's when I went to work for Clee Dodge, down at Dodge Fibers back then. So I guess I found my home there because I stayed there for 33 years. You worked for Clee Dodge for 33 years? For Clee Dodge, uh, I was the fourth person on the payroll. My first job actually was uh, painting his office on a Saturday. And I, I worked there, as I said, from 33 years, and I had various jobs. I, uh, I was a, a laborer, tower operator for a few years, then I got to be chief inspector in the quality control department, and then I got to be quality control manager for quite a few years, and then I went to in the production manager for a couple of years, and I didn't like that as well as quality control, so when I retired in 1989, I had been quality control manager for about 23 years. And that's what I liked the best, I guess. I see. And they were good to me. I hope I was good to them. Yeah. So, I retired in 1989, and here I am. All right, tell us a little about getting married stuff. Got married, Alice, 1947. What was her maiden name? Uh, Welch. She, uh... Was she a native she, around here? Or? She lived in Hoosick, uh, actually in Petersburg Junction. I had known her, uh, well, they lived where Ernie Tilly lives now, the Tilly farm over there when we were yeah. yay high. Yeah. And then she moved to Bennington, and when I got out of service, she had moved back to the parents' homestead down at Petersburg Junction. We were married in 1947. I think we were the last couple to be married in the rectory in the Catholic Church. Alice is Catholic and I was Protestant. And at that time you couldn't marry in the Catholic Church unless both of you were Catholic. But it, it seems to have been work. It, it'll be 55 years next month, so I guess, oh, it, wonderful. I guess it's all right. 
<laughs> had two daughters, both of whom you probably knew one time or another. Carol was born in 1948, and Kathy was born in 1959. Both very successful in their field, which we're happy with. What are they doing? Carol is now a, a kindergarten teacher in uh, George Washington School down at, in, uh, oh no, she switched to wine and skill, I'm sorry. Yeah. And Kathy is a co-manager of, of uh, an outfit called Helping Hand, it's an, you probably know it, it's a non-profit uh, organization out on Route 9 that deals with retarded or, or uh, retarded is not the word. What am I looking for? Well, let's say handicapped. Handicapped, that's yeah. exactly what I'm looking for. And uh, she's been there for quite a number of years and likes that. Great. And, uh, and you still... Has, oh, God. Carol has two children. Uh, one gra Both graduated from Siena. Grandson works in Fleet Bank in, in Albany. And uh, granddaughter is just starting this week as a biology teacher out in Fort Collins, Colorado. So, going to get married next year out there. And I'm sure we'll spend a week out there for that uh, venture. And All right, so since 89 you've been retired. Been retired. Live in Hoosick. Live in Hoosick. Have traveled as much as we can. We've been uh, all over the USA, all over Great Britain, Canada. Uh, go every, I keep telling everybody, when, as soon as I find any money in the checkbook, we take off. Right. Which and is essentially what we do. I see you walking in Hoosick a we lot, walk, you and your well, wife. Most every morning we walk two miles. This year we haven't walked as much because during the hot time, I don't like to walk in the heat, so we've been getting up early in the morning and working for an hour or two in the garden instead of walking, but pretty quick we'll start walking again. Yeah, yeah well. Keep, keep this going. Yep, uh, you're both in good shape. I, I see yeah. a lot of you. We like to dance, as you know. Yeah. We see you doing the same thing. Yeah. So, okay, is there anything else you'd like to say I about who, the area or anything I before we close? Anything. I wouldn't live anywhere else, I guess. I've seen a lot of areas in my 79 years, and I guess I'm going to stay right here. Well, we thank you for telling your story. We thank you very much. We thank you.